Hello, and welcome to Turtle Wow News with Brograg. I'm the Orc, and here's the news. Generally on this program, I try to have broadcasts go out around the time that the server is reset, because that's when the change log comes out. Late Tuesday for the US and early Wednesday morning for Europe. I've trolled through the GitHub bug tracker, however, and I've tried to keep an eye on things, so I'll be honest with you. The change log is late, and I'm pretty convinced that even when it does come out, there won't be too much interesting to even speak about. But fear not. I've been busy all week, making other news pieces, including live interviews and market analysis. But first, here's our top story. During the middle of last week, Porto posted a link to a live podcast hosted by Designer Dave, an ex-Blizzard developer who worked on Warcraft 3 and early development of WoW. The reason for the fanfare was because joining Dave was two Turtle WoW team members, Shang the narrative and design lead, as well as Deacon, a Turtle WoW writer. The podcast was a little under two hours long, but your intrepid news anchor orc sat down and listened to all of it for all the juiciest bits of news and information that I can possibly render on to you. I encourage everyone who has the time to listen to the podcast to do so. Designer Dave has some great insights on how WoW was developed since he helped in its early stages. Though game design theory was not the only interesting thing talked about aside from Dave's strong belief that gnomes shouldn't be in the game. Listeners learned that if Blizzard were to ever try to shut down the server, that Torta and the hardware team have redundancies in alternate hosting locations to preserve the special community we've all found here. It certainly was a nice relief given TurtleWow's fast-paced growth and growing anxieties about Big Brother Blizzard bringing down the banhammer. There weren't just assurances about health and stability of the server mentioned by the TurtleWow team members. They were letting slip sneak peeks into the coming content likely to drop in 1.16.6 or in further patches. Shang made mention of how he has been tirelessly working on Gilneas, the walled city now home to werewolves and all kinds of creepy crawlies. If Shang is to be believed, there will be a new instance available when Gilneas gets released, and it won't simply be a haunted city or a lazy port of the Cataclysm client assets. Of course, the other big news is that we have audio confirmation that the next high-level raid for the Emerald Sanctum will have its entrance in the Mount Hygel area, which, as of right now, is only accessible through wall jump trickery. For anyone who has been to Mount Hygel during Vindalar Classic, or even explored on this server, you'd know that there is already an existing raid portal, though whether or not that is just a connection point from Southern Winter Spring, or is a proper raid portal is not yet known. Furthermore, when asked about whether there will be quests that offer raid level gear or alternate pre-raid best in slot items in Hyjal, Shang confirmed that there will indeed be gear from quests like that, though epic level gear will still require large groups or raids to attain. We understand though that Hyjal is definitely going to be a zone with questing, not the currently barren yet beautiful world it is currently. So did you listen to the podcast? Did you find out anything else interesting that might have slipped by Vrograg's keen ears? Make sure to let us know. I'd especially like to know your thoughts on the offhanded remarks that the Turtle Wow team members made about Crusader Strike. Big things are on the horizon in Turtle Wow, and we've just begun to hear the rumbles of patch 1.16.6. Though no class changes have officially been announced, when they do happen, they usually roll out with patches. So I thought we'd take a look at forum user Rafale, who put up a poll asking what the people wanted devs to focus on as far as ongoing class problems. Now a poll, all by itself, isn't evidence that something will or won't change, but community polls have historically been a bellwether for what the dev team plans to do. The last memorable poll was about world buffs and whether or not to remove them for raiders. That poll's results matched the team's actions in removing world buffs, of course. So maybe, now we'd like to take a look at the results of this poll from the over 500 votes entered, and see what the class community wants in upcoming patches. We'll start alphabetically with druids. Nearly a full 50% who answered pointed to manual crowd pummeler reliance, and not being able to use potions in form as an issue for our furry friends. It seems that the beast within the druid also hungers for wind fury, 
while the Feather Druids, or Moonkins, want support for their nature spells via nature curses, and overall their poor item choices. Maybe Druids will start to feel more free in their form to be like other players in their groups. Next we have Hunter. Two large complaints voted on were about their pet companions not having AoE avoidance and not having any unique skills. Naturally, the Beast Mastery spec as a whole seemingly needs a read work. And of course, the Melee Hunter is still considered a meme. Lastly, they pointed to Wyvern Sting being a bad talent for their 31 points they have to spend to get it. With any luck, we might see more of those adorable Hunter pets in group content. Our orange conjuring friends, the mages, filled their ballots with displeasure at how the arcane specialization has been performing, both in which spell it uses and how it underperforms versus its hot and cold counterpart. Lastly, they voted on the lack of any complex rotation. Seems our smart spell slingers want more to be tested on. The Righteous Paladins voted majorly on two measures, and both revolved around their protection specialization. The only other plate wearers, other than warriors, want a less awkward taunt and better itemization overall, so they can perform better as most plate wearers want to do, as tanks. The disciples of both the Light and the Shadow cast their vote to wish for better balanced class racials and Shadow Priests having some type of AoE option. Rogues overwhelmingly voted to have their combo points not vanish, get it, when they switch targets. And they are also lobbying for a world where they can both use poisons and wind fury on their main hand weapons. The much maligned shaman voted on many propositions, covering things from poor itemization, lack of spell shield options at lower levels, underwhelming performance from certain totems, or outright uselessness. Of course, the notoriously mana starved class voted for better mana sustain in their two thirsty specializations, Enhancement and Elemental. Lastly, a repeat from the Druid wish list, a curse that would make a creature more vulnerable to nature damage. Seems like there is a lot of work to be done for our totem dropping horde friends. The demon loving warlocks came out to remark about how poorly the affliction talent tree performs. Similar to hunters, complaints were voted on about the lackluster activity of warlock pets. Immolate, the spell, was also called out as a useless PvE spell. Finally, the Warriors, the very top of the DPS and tanking heap, even wanted some adjustments. Rend and Revenge not scaling seemed to be the biggest sour spot for the mighty Weapon Masters. In an interesting move, they voted that the two-handed specialization of Warriors be improved because it evidently gets less results but requires more effort, a notion that likely has frustrated some. The last item that was voted on was the Diamond Flask meta. The flask, of course, being a sunken temple quest reward that, given the right healer gear, can be used to grant warriors massive threat and a healthy heal over time. Make sure to keep these community posts in mind going into the future. No one can know for sure exactly what class changes will or won't be made, but by working together and speaking frankly to the community members and development team staff, we might be able to get the class changes we want, and sometimes the ones we need. Last week, we reported on the changes made to how Eco drops for the many players who seek it out. Today, I'll attempt something that was a little harder than it seems, and actually interview players in full RP to get their opinion on the matter. So, I take to the streets to find out if Eco dropping at a higher rate, but only for one person, is making an impact on the community. So without further ado, I'll pass the broadcast off to reporter on the RP streets, Vrograg Fish Slayer. Hi, thanks Vrograg Anchor Orc. I'm here in the cold, sleepy goblin city of Everlook with my trusty mic that will inevitably disappear from my hand the second I emote to interview anyone vocal or bored enough to speak with a random orc on the matter. For your viewing pleasure, all voices were run through TTS and footage shortened so you don't have to wait for people to type out the responses to my questions in the Say channel. So, let's see what's happening. I think that gives advantages to classes that can solo lots of enemies at once, but classes that can't might have more trouble. 
I just got my cash of Maori yesterday. I need to farm eco for the 5% dodge buff, so it will make it easier for me. I can solo lots of mobs as a prod paladin. I'm not gonna lie to you, it has not affected me in the least. I did hear that selling eco used to be good money, but I never took bark in the eco trade. Not enough time has passed, I think people are still trying to figure out the positives and negatives. I just arrived in winter spring, but I always like to share my opinion. Did anyone do the math on this? Seems like it's easier for solo farming and less good for group farming, especially 5 mans. It will increase the grind, but if getting ecos was just a no-brainer before this might be a good change. Instead of autopiloting it, people will have to prep a little. I like it cause the drop rate was terrible, at least on this server before. Now I go 39 times Juju Flurry in 5 minutes, so I can get ready for raids faster. I think it is a nerf to do it in a group so the prices on Winterfall Firewater went up, only part I don't like. I think it's a nice change, let's see what people have to say, time will tell. They can always roll back to an older version. It seems like this change is directed at those less fortunate, which is a shame. I believe they are out to get those who multibox for their farming, although this is to be expected when the targets are elites with a great deal of HP and damage. With eco it was annoying to ping and make sure all got their eco. I think it's a good attempt for a change, for the individual farmer I think, not for the casual player. It is a nuanced question for someone who farmed over 20k gold in firewater alone here back in the day silly face. Well, so there you have it, a little bit of everything. My impression from the whole experience is that the change to eco has been met with as much celebration as consternation. I hope you enjoyed a little RP interview from our field correspondent, Vrograg Fishlayer. Let us know if you'd like to see more. Before we close out our program, we would like to try something new. As always here at Turtle Wow News with Vrograg, we are trying to expand our news reach. So, with some encouragement from the community, we also have prepared a little segment I like to call Market Watch. Because, what is a news program without some news about the various financial institutions that help keep things running? So let's cut to the deepest analysis available on the server's only auction house with gold investment professional, Vrograg. Auction house market analyst Vrograg here, let's take a look at the week in review. All these data points are average values scanned by SuperDuperAuctions.com, a website that scans TurtleWow Auction House on the hour by the hour. I've taken data points from the website, jammed them into a spreadsheet, and hopefully can give some market insights with some visuals I've prepared. Since this is a first try at this, I took what is considered the big five commodities for any vanilla era server. Cured Rugged Hides, Arcane Crystals, Mooncloth, Black Lotus, and Large Brilliant Shards. I also added a data graph for Grom's Blood that we'll get to later. We can see here that the prices mostly trended flat, showing a good healthy economy, though there was some volatility. Let's take a closer look. Black Lotus, as expected, did have a price hike around the weekend, accounting for all the raiders buying consumes. Though afterward, it returned back to its normal price hovering around 18.5 gold. Arcane Crystals remained mostly flat around 14.5 gold, swinging up and down in price as miners brought in their goods and weekend loggers came in to do their Arcanite cooldown. Cured Rugged Hides showed a steady decline over the week, indicating that the 22.5 gold might be the new price standard for the crafted good. There was even a massive price drop late Sunday. Keep an eye out, bargain hunters. Mooncloth remained very stable throughout the week, finding a nice price range around 24 gold. Large Brilliant Shards likewise stayed flat around 5.25 gold, with momentary price swings up and down as market forces pushed and pulled it. Lastly, I wanted to take a closer look at a real market mover this last week, Grom's Blood. For some time, the herb necessary for Flask of the Titans would flirt with the sub 1 gold price point. But during the Friday and Saturday rush for raiders and PvPers, the market rallied to above 1.5 gold per Grom's Blood, twice in fact, 
entrepreneurial investors may want to look at taking advantage of these market forces. And buyers, likewise, may want to keep these trends in mind to save a few gold before your next consume-heavy activity. Let me know what you think of this segment, and I'll keep stripping data from superduperauctions.com. I might be able to give more insights into longer trends because the site only posts prices for the last full week. Big thanks to them and to the people who pointed me to the site for this segment. All right, that's enough for Market Watch. Let's get back to Vrograg at the hovel he calls a studio. We here at Turtle Wow News with Vrograg would like to thank you for taking time out of your day to spend it with us. We hope you enjoyed today's program, and thank you for your support and advice in establishing this show as the premier news broadcast in this version of Azeroth. If you enjoyed the content, please leave a like and click on the subscribe button to not miss out on any other broadcasts. We are working on some new stuff that we think you'll love. Remember to message me if you see me on and would like to give feedback, or drop a comment in the section below. Since this is a small community, I can pretty much get back to everyone. I appreciate the engagement. For now, that is all the time we have. Stay safe, and remember, the deadliest weapon is knowledge.